Well, uh, happy 2020, everybody. So since it's a new year and all that, I kind of want to get some of that new year, new me mentality in by exercising a little bit. And considering it's still pretty dang cold outside, I figured I could also warm myself up with a quick little workout. So uh, let's see what kind of options I have. Now I'm gonna play virtual sports on my Famicom. The Famicom is such a haven for accessories. I can pretty much spend multiple core videos just talking about all the wacky stuff Nintendo came up for it. Maybe make it a series called AK Family Computer or something. Hmm, I'll jot that down. But today I want to focus on something from Konami. You know, the Pachinko guys. That was a low blow, I'm sorry. But anyway, here's something you might find intriguing. Ladies and gentlemen, and all in between, I present to you the Konami Hypershot. These are a pair of controllers that, uh, just look at it, it's pretty self-explanatory. They're just two plastic slabs with two huge buttons on each of them. The first time I came across them, I had several questions. For example, why? Alright, I'm not gonna make fun of how ridiculous they seem to be at first glance, because one advantage this does have over the regular Famicom controllers is that the buttons are larger, and thus more mash-friendly. You'll see the reasoning behind the emphasis on button mashing convenience as we take a look at the whopping two games that supported the controller, Hyper Olympic and Hyper Sports, both of them sports-themed and published by Konami. Both of these games were originally arcade titles, then given slightly downgraded ports to the Famicom. I suppose these specialized controllers are sort of a way to replicate the original arcade controls, which according to photos just consisted of large run and jump buttons. The Hypershot doesn't have duplicate buttons, but if you're left-handed, you can also just flip the controller upside down. Accessibility It's also pretty neat that the Hypershot already has two controllers connected together for two-player competition. Considering the controller retailed for around 2,000 yen when it first released, or around 22 US dollars today, that's a pretty good deal for two controllers in one. As another side note, there is in fact another licensed accessory for the Famicom that's also called the Hypershot, but that's a sick looking light gun made by Bandai instead. I mean, at least with this one, the name fits a little bit better, but in this house, we don't shoot, we mash buttons hard. <laughs> Well, let's take a look at the first game to use the Konami Hypershot, Hyper Olympic. Fun fact, the original arcade release is actually one of the very first officially licensed Olympic video games, this one being for the 1984 Summer Olympics in Los Angeles. It's cool to see the tradition that somehow got picked up by Mario and Sonic got its start here. Huh, the title theme is Chariots of Fire, or as I like to call it, the motivational meme song. Another fun fact, this player sprite is actually different from that in the regular version of the game. That's because the copy I have is, as the sticker on it declares, a limited edition. Long story short, this version was most likely given away as a promotion for a Japanese comedy show sponsored by Konami, which featured comedian Ken Shimura dressed as the Japanese king with a foolish persona, so the player character in this version of the game resembles him. If you want to know more, I'll link to this video by Gaijillionaire, which goes more in depth about its appearances in other video games. Anyway, Hyper Olympic on the Famicom has four different events to choose from. 100 meter dash is pretty self-explanatory. You race against the computer or a second player by mashing the run button. And boy do you mash the run button, the CPU can put up quite a fight. This is where I start to appreciate the large buttons on the Hypershot a lot more. Button mashing definitely feels a lot easier here than on a standard controller. The arcade original actually featured two run buttons so you could alternate between them. You can actually kind of simulate this by lining up the two Hypershot controllers side by side, as both run buttons will work in single player, but it's actually way less effective. You're better off just smashing one button. This is actually one of the first games to start the age-old tradition of button mashing in running minigames. Apparently, players of the arcade version often use tricks like swiping coins and rulers over the buttons to mash them faster, and arcade owners reported high rates of damage to the machines as a result. Yikes, Japan ain't screwing around when it comes to button mashing. <laughs> Moving on to the long jump. You run down the runway by mashing the button as always, and uh, long jump. 
When you press the jump button, the duration you hold it for changes the angle at which you jump at. You preferably want around a 45 degree angle for the best results. One time I actually managed to beat the real life long jump world record of 8.95 meters. So uh, I'll have that Guinness certificate, thank you very much. Next up, the 110 meter hurdles. You've probably figured out how to play this one, don't you? And finally, the javelin throw. This controls very similar to the long jump, in fact it might be too similar. You run just as usual and then throw the javelin with the jump button, controlling the angle in basically the same way. Even the optimal angle to throw at is pretty much the same. Though I won't lie, compared to the long jump, it's way more satisfying to hear the javelin make that noise as it slowly flies through the air. So uh, this game wasn't really all too exciting. The four minigames don't really feel too distinct from one another. Heck, two of them share basically the exact same controls. Well, at least there's another game to look at, Hypersports. This is another arcade conversion, this time for the sequel to Hyper Olympic. This time around, you start off at the first event, skeet shooting, and must get to a certain score to qualify for the next game. And wow, this is totally different. You have to shoot at clay targets flying across the screen. You have two aiming reticles to your left and right that move automatically, and each button on the hyper shot allows you to shoot in that direction. Even with two reticles though, this is still quite challenging because of how small they are. If you miss a shot twice, your controls will be temporarily locked, so you can't just smash your way through and have to do it with absolute precision. It almost feels like I'm playing a rhythm game at times. The aiming reticles do grow larger with each consecutive shot though, and if you didn't get into the groove of things, you can indeed get a perfect score, in which case a UFO flies by to award you more points. Next up is the triple jump. This is once again similar to the long jump from Hyper Olympic, only this time you jump 3 times. For some reason though, I had a lot of trouble just jumping far enough to get a qualifying score of 13 meters, even when I tried my best to follow the optimal angles. And if you don't get a qualifying score within 3 turns, you get a game over and are sent back to the beginning. So that was a lot of clay targets I had to shoot just to get another attempt at the triple jump. Nope. That ah! was oh, so close. Come on. <laughs> well, I persevered and somehow managed to get a far enough jump to land it. Please don't ask me how. Anyway, the third event is archery, and it's a uh, kind of weird. First of all, it's played from a top-down view. The target moves from the top to bottom, and timing your button press correctly is what affects your horizontal aim. How long you hold the button, on the other hand, adjusts the angle that you shoot at, thus affecting your vertical aim. It's kind of confusing at first, but it's simple once you grasp it. If you time it right and aim for an angle of around 5 degrees, you should be able to hit the center fairly easily. On one occasion, I actually managed to make this guy with an apple on his head show up, but I don't know the requirements behind- OH GOD! Lastly, we have the high jump. Just like all the jumping events before it, you get a running start and then press jump to presumably jump over the pole. I say presumably because in the free, count them three times I got far enough to reach this event, I've either jumped too early or hit the pole no matter what I tried. Holding down the jump button adjusts your angle again, and apparently you can retract your legs once you cross the pole to avoid bumping into it. But honestly, at this point, I just lost motivation to constantly retry it. Especially since I had to deal with the ridiculous triple jump in the first place. It's the last event in the game anyway. And clearing it just gives you an overview of the world record scores before starting a second loop. Not even your final scores. In general, I definitely prefer Hyper Sports over Hyper Olympic. It has a greater variety of games and has its own challenge, even if it seems unfair at times. Makes sense for a sequel to improve on the original. And gamers in the West actually got a sweeter deal, because Konami combined the games from both Hyper Olympic and Hyper Sports and released them in the West as track and field. The Hypershot controller didn't get a Western release, so the controls were remapped to the D-pad and A button on the NES controller. 
But hey, you get to select from all 8 events to play separately from a menu now. And it actually fixed the controls in the triple jump so you actually jump far this time. So uh, nice work. Still, the original Japanese release has its own interesting story to tell, with its controller accessories and special editions and whatnot. The fact that Konami released a pair of controllers specifically designed for button mashing on a game system that already has two regular controllers built in really demonstrates the fostering competitive spirit of Japanese gamers. And of course, we're all still button mashing in video games to this day. Should still work on that game accessibility thing though, not everyone can mash like Takahashi Majin. Well, that's about it for the Konami Hypershot. I guess I'm just gonna end this video on a small piece of trivia. This was gonna be a things of interest video just on the Hypershot controllers, but then I played the two games and figured that this is worthy of its own core video. So I hope you did learn a thing or two about it. I guess now I just have to figure out an ending because I have no idea how to end this video. Uh, screw it.